Cool movers and shakers. This morning, an exclusive interview with Rachel Reeves, for the first time speaking in number 11. Has she got used to what might be the toughest job in government? Well, I am getting used to it, but uh, yes, I do have to pinch myself occasionally. And one in, one out. He left number 11 just a fortnight ago, but Jeremy Hunt is here this morning in his first interview since the general election. And there is a treat in store. Nicola Benedetti, the director of the Edinburgh Festival and musician extraordinaire. And singing for their supper at the desk with me today, Bloomberg economist Stephanie Flanders to check out the Chancellor's claims, Labour MP Zara Sultana and the comedian and impressionist, we might hear a few of them later, John Coleshaw. Morning, morning. Let's check out what is making the news. There is no one dominant story this morning. As we are at the BBC, the Telegraph is leading on the likelihood of pay rises for public sector workers. The Sunday Times reminds Rachel Reeves of the pressure on her to lift the bar on families with more than two kids claiming some benefits and strictly makes some of the front pages as well with claims about bullying and bad behaviour on the show. Let's talk then about Rachel Reeves to you three as we're going to for most of today. Um, Stephanie, you study the economy probably more intently than almost <laughs> anybody else in the country. How grim is the picture for her, do you think? Yeah, I mean, one, at one level, the, the short term picture is brighter than it's been for a while. Got inflation that's been, been coming down uh, to target and it's still it's looking fairly under control, may fall even further and you've got growth kicking up so the sort of very short-term view is we're sort of out of the woods but actually then there's the sort of thick the fiscal thicket mm -hmm. is the constraints that we've had from years of subpar growth and particularly productivity output per head also falling short year after year and that's why she talked about growth a lot on the campaign mm -hmm. and it's very boring to talk about growth but you know that's going to be a central element of what she has to prove to people you know we've got some optimism you certainly feel it in the city and global markets Britain does look like a sort of oasis of calm and clarity um, with this new government. So I think there'll be a fair wind, but it really matters what she does that encourages private investment, mm -hmm. shows us how she's going to do more public investment and also managed to put a bit more money in public services because there's some very tight plans coming down the track. And she hints certainly at those pay rises coming down the track in our interview we'll hear in a few minutes. But Zara, you're a Labour MP, but you make no secret of the fact you think Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer aren't really bold enough. They're not radical enough for you. So what do you want to hear from her today? The King's speech uh, has many bills that I'm really looking forward to, which is a very unique concept to me. <laughs> As someone who was elected in 2019, when it comes to the New Deal for working people, when we're talking about bringing rail into public ownership, it's no secret I would like the party to go further if we're going to nationalise rail. Let's look at mail, let's look at water. When we look at the New Deal for working people, we need to make sure that we're repealing all anti-trade union legislation, uh, which has hindered trade unions from really being able to exercise um, uh, their powers in terms of defending the interests of their members. Personally, when, we, when I look at the King's speech, I'd like the party to also adopt scrapping the two-child benefit mm. cap. This is something that Gordon Brown has called for. This is something that Anna Sawa and Scottish Labour have policy for. Therefore, uh, Scottish MSPs are mandated to uh, vote to scrap that. So you're as not well giving as up on that. Upholding international law and ending arms sales to Israel. Okay, and you're not giving up on that. And we do talk to Rachel Reeves about that in a few minutes' time. But John, last time you were here, just briefly, you were quite disobliging about Rishi Sunak and you were also quite disobliging about Keir Starmer. As a citizen um, on the yes. panel today, how do you look at the landscape now? Well, it's all looking rather sensible, really. <laughs> you know, after the fervent times, you know, the tumbling ball of energy of Boris Johnson and Liz Truss, Dominic Cummings, all of that sort of stuff, it feels now there is at least some sensibility. We can pause. The giddy times can just rest for a little and let us see where we are led to next. OK, well, yeah. let us see where we are by 10 a.m. this morning. We'll be back with you shortly. Well, Rachel Reeves is certainly delighted to be the first woman chancellor. But for Labour and for all of us, there is an awful lot riding on her success or her failure. Yesterday, I went to number 11. So, Chancellor, have you got used to being called that? Well, actually, Keir Starmer used uh, the words, as he said the other day, 
and this afternoon the Chancellor and I thought, oh, what's he done now? And then, <laughs> and then I remembered it was me. Uh, so I am getting used to it, but uh, yes, I do have to pinch myself occasionally. Last time I was on this programme was eight weeks ago and it was the first weekend of the election uh, campaign. And I think you said to me in that interview, in a, a few weeks time, you might be Chancellor. And uh, that is exactly what I am. And I feel very proud and privileged to be in this position, especially as the first female Chancellor of the Exchequer that this country has ever had. You have very, very hard work ahead of you, however. You asked officials almost as soon as you arrived to give you a sort of warts and all verdict on the state of the public finances. What have you found out that you didn't know? Well, I was clear during the election that the scale of the challenge was going to be immense. It was why during the election campaign I didn't make any commitments that weren't fully funded and fully costed. Very different to what the outgoing Conservative government did where they racked up a load of spending commitments even during the campaign. I wasn't going to do that because I knew that we'd have to make difficult decisions. And you're right, I asked officials that first weekend after the election to do a full analysis of the state of the public finances, the uh, public spending pressures that we're under. And I've committed to present that to Parliament by the end of this month. And, and I will do that because I really want to be honest with people. I think people know that things are a mess. The first Parliament, the last one, where living standards were lower at the end than they were at the beginning public services on their knees, a tax burden at a 70 year high, debt almost the same size as our entire economy. So I'm going to level with people about the scale of the challenge and then begin to fix the foundations so we can start rebuild our country and our economy. But you and some other ministers have been suggesting since you arrived in power that things are somehow worse than you knew from the, in from the outside. What is it that you have seen that has actually given you that belief because most of the information was in the public domain whether it was about prisons or about well courts. I'll give you one example you, you mentioned prisons I don't think anyone realized quite how bad things were that uh, the prisons were at crisis point with almost no places left for people to be given a place in prison if they needed to be there and the previous government, instead of making tough decisions, they simply ran away from the problem. They called an election uh, to allow the next people to make those uh, decisions. Uh, it makes me pretty angry that they left the country in this sort of state. Whichever political party you're in, you should try and pass on at the end of your time in office a country and a society that is working better. This Conservative government didn't do that and they've left it to us to pick up the pieces. But are you suggesting that they deliberately called an election to cover up how bad things were on the inside? Because when it comes to prisons, which you mentioned, for example, the information about what was going on was published all the time. It was in the public domain. No, no it, it, Laura, that's just simply not the case. I don't think anybody on the outside understood the full extent of the challenge in our prisons. Let me give you another example. The Conservative former Education Secretary, uh, she had the pay review body recommendation for teachers on her desk when she was in office. She didn't do anything about it. She didn't publish it. She didn't say how she was going to respond to it. They called an election. They didn't make the tough decisions. They ran away from them. And it's now up to us to fix it and to pick up the pieces. And we will do that. And we will do it in an open and transparent way. I will be honest with people that there are going to be tough decisions ahead. It's not going to be easy, but I'm determined to turn things around. And it's why also that first weekend in the Treasury, I said to officials, we've got to break out of this sort of doom loop of low growth, high taxes and deteriorating public services. We've got to grow the economy. The election campaign, you'd think that the economy was just about tax and spend. I mean, frankly, that's all the Conservatives know. But there's another part of the economy, and that's how big it is and how quickly it grows. And we'll come to that in just a second. But you raised the question of pay. Now, we understand that the pay review bodies have recommended a rise of 5.5%. Now, that is more than people in this building and number 11 were expecting. It's more than the former government had budgeted for, it's more than you had budgeted for. Would you as a Chancellor who's just said you want to be honest and people have to be prepared for tough decisions, would you be prepared to ignore the recommendations of the independent bodies and risk a period of strikes with the unions by not giving them the pay rises they seek? I really value public service workers in our schools, in our hospitals, uh, in our police as well. 
at the moment we are looking at those pay review body recommendations, uh, doing the analysis and we will work with public sector workers uh, on that uh, and later this month we will uh, make announcements around public sector pay when we do that full analysis of the public finances and, and public spending. But we also know that there is a cost to not settling, uh, a cost of further industrial action, a cost in terms of the challenge that we face in recruiting, retaining uh, doctors and nurses and teachers uh, as well. But we'll do it in a proper way uh, and make sure uh, that the sums add up. There's a question of principle though. And when you were asked about this in opposition, you said that the most important thing to you was your commitment to your spending limits, those fiscal rules as they are known. So I'll ask again, in principle, are you willing as Chancellor to ignore the recommendations for increasing the pay for teachers and other public well, we'll sector set workers? That all out. We'll set that all out uh, later this month. But there I value important... the work that public sector uh, workers uh, do. They provide a huge service to our country. Uh, and, but we will set it out in, in the proper way later this month. People won't have long to wait. We will do that before uh, this month is out. And I can see you don't want to give the detail of what decision you may make. But there is an important question of principle here. Ministers are expected in normal times to follow the recommendations of the independent pay review bodies. That's the point of having them. It's yeah. meant to take the politics no, I, out I, of I it. I totally understand so, that. And we are in a position where the previous government um, uh, gave a mandate uh, to the pay review bodies, uh, but they haven't uh, properly factored in the cost of it. That is what this review will be about, looking at the state of the public services, uh, the state of the public uh, finances. But there is also a cost of not settling because the cost of this ongoing industrial action, the cost of failing to be able to recruit and retain the doctors, the nurses and teachers, that also has an impact on our economy. But I've just come back to this point. You know, we are in a situation where there are huge spending pressures and our economy is so weak as is not generating the tax revenues that we need to fund our public services. It's why we have to grow our economy, because otherwise we'll just continue for the next five years having these conversations of how can you afford this, how can you afford that. The only way that we're going to be able to afford the public services that our country needs and deserves, whilst also being able to keep taxes low, is to have an economy that is generating the wealth and prosperity, and which is why uh, we're setting out today the reforms to the pension system, them. It's why I overturned uh, previous government decisions on planning, more reforms to the planning system in the first 72 hours of this Labour government than we had from the last government in 14 years. And it's why we've established a national wealth fund to unlock private sector investment in some of the jobs and industries of the future. We have to grow our economy. That is the only way we're going to get out of the predicament we find ourselves in after 14 years of Conservative government. And I will ask you more about that in just a second, but on this very important question of this recommendation of 5.5% pay increases for public sector workers, if you went ahead with that, what would the effect on your spending plans be? Because that is a huge amount of money that was not planned for. It would blow your numbers, wouldn't it? Well, you know the fiscal rules that we are going to balance day-to-day -day spending with tax receipts. We'll get debt down as a share of our economy by the end of the forecast period. And then subject to that, invest in the things that we need to grow our economy. Those fiscal rules are non-negotiable. Uh, we will do a budget in the autumn. I will set the date for that budget and the spending review uh, when I make the statement to Parliament later uh, this month. But we will do things in a proper way. Every time that we do a budget, we will have a forecast from the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility. Earlier this week in the King's speech, uh, we announced a, a bill uh, for budget responsibility, including a fiscal lock. So never again can a Prime Minister or Chancellor um, do a budget or a mini budget, as they called it, uh, with unfunded commitments around tax and expenditure, because we saw what happened with the Conservatives' mini budget with £45 billion of unfunded commitments. No one got those tax cuts. What they did get is huge increases in their mortgage rates, which is why fiscal responsibility and financial stability is the cornerstone of everything that I will do as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Then when it comes to your pension reforms then, you are promising to update the rules in the hope that it will bring lots of investment in or unlock lots of investment from big piles of cash that are sitting around in the market not being used properly. I've heard politicians promise this kind of change to pensions many times. Why do you think you'll actually get it done this time and what do you hope to achieve? 
So I'm confident that we will be able to make the changes because in the King's speech uh, earlier this week, we set aside time for a pensions bill. There hasn't been a pensions bill for four years. That was four chancellors ago. And so subsequent chancellors have said, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. But they never actually did it. I'm about deeds, not just words. And so we will have that pensions bill and it will do uh, the things that are necessary. And there are two things that are necessary. First of all, people who make sacrifices and save every month to put something aside for their retirement, they deserve better than the returns they're getting on those savings today. At the moment, when people retire, they find that the security that they hoped that retirement would bring because they saved all their lives just isn't there. And those pensions aren't delivering for people. But there's a second issue as well. That's the one that you alluded to. There are £800 billion worth of DC defined contribution pension savings or there will be within the next couple of years. There's also £360 billion in local government pension schemes. That money, frankly, is not working well enough for savers, but it's also not working well enough for our economy. If we could unlock just 1% of the money in defined contribution schemes and invest that in more productive assets, fast-growing British companies, that'd be £8 billion to help finance growth and prosperity and wealth creation here in Britain. So this is so important. It's so important to ensure that working people are better off, but it's also so important to our growth mission so that we can create that wealth and prosperity across the whole country. That's why there's an urgency here from this government about unlocking that investment uh, for our economy and delivering for working people who make big sacrifices, but at the moment are being let down by the pensions industry. You mentioned planning and some of the big decisions the government's already made. But Ed Miliband, your colleague, is already appears to be forcing through a giant solar farm in Suffolk, which many local residents do not want. The council says it is shocked. Are you saying to people today, in order to get the economy going, people are just going to have to suck it up? They're going to have to tolerate things in their local communities that they don't want? We can't carry on like we are. We can't carry on not building energy infrastructure and not building housing. Because if we carry on like we are, energy bills are going to continue to go through the roof. We're going to continue to be reliant on Putin and dictators around the world for our basic energy needs. And I'm not willing for our country to be at the mercy of dictators in that way. But that so means, have to by build. implication, people in communities sometimes are just going to have to suck but it up. We're going to have to, have to make up. tough decisions. We are going to have to make tough decisions and I'm not going to shy away from that because a failure to make those decisions and some of these decisions were sitting on the previous Conservative Energy Minister's desk for months and she wasn't willing to make those difficult decisions and we are. Now we believe that if you host nationally significant infrastructure that you should get something in return uh, for that but we can't just keep saying no to investment projects, whether that's housing, uh, data centres, energy infrastructure, transport infrastructure. Because if we do, our economy will continue like it has been. And that's not delivering from working people. We've got to turn things around. The reality of that, no, now you're in power, means that an MP sitting in an office in Westminster can impose things on communities that don't want it. This new government also wants to nationalise the railways over time. You want to have your own energy company. You want to take these very micro decisions on planning here in Westminster. Do you think government knows best? Well, for housing, for example, we're going to reinstate local housing uh, targets. But then it'll be up to local authorities to decide where to build that housing. But the answer to new projects can't always be no. It's up to them to decide where the housing should go. Uh, but... They have got to deliver against those targets because home ownership is going backwards. Um, fewer people are being able to get on the housing ladder. Rents have gone through uh, the roof. It's just not right. It's just not fair on the next generation. But there's a principle, and I, I just wonder if you would acknowledge, maybe you're proud of it, that this new government is significantly expanding the powers of the state. I mean, people might look at some of the things that you want to get involved in and think, oh, actually, this group of people, with the intentions that you set out of changing the country, but actually you're willing to be quite control freakish. Well, on railways, for example, when those franchises come up, 
we will bring them back into public ownership, public uh, control. And I think that most people would think that that's a big improvement on the fragmented system that we have uh, today. Uh, and so that is a decision that, yes, we will make that decision. It is different from what the Conservatives have done these last 14 years. But we want a transport system that uh, delivers for people before profit and, uh, and has a more reliable, uh, more integrated transport system. So, yes, we are going to make different decisions. Things aren't going to carry on as they were. We were elected on a mandate to change things, not to carry on as we were, because people were sick of the status quo. We're not about the status quo. We're about changing things for the better. But with that focus always on how can we improve lives for ordinary working people. And in terms of those people you mentioned who you want to put more money in their pocket, you talked during the election campaign, I remember hearing you mention it lots of times, about meeting people who genuinely were struggling to pay for the weekly shop, struggling to put food on the table. But yet there is nothing that we can see in the first few weeks of the decisions that you've made that right now immediately puts money in the pockets of the least well-off in this country, the very poorest, are not seeing anything from this Labour government that will immediately put money in their pocket. I'm not claiming that we're going to be able to turn everything around straight away, but let me give you two examples of things that were uh, in the King's speech. Creating GB Energy, a wholly publicly owned energy company to bring people's energy bills uh, down, and also our plans to uh, insulate more homes to reduce people's energy bills. But second, the New Deal for working people, uh, so that we can turn the minimum wage into a real living wage and ban exploitative zero-hour contracts to give security uh, to working people. Those are just two examples around reducing energy bills and ensuring dignity at work and better wages and more security but the question, to improve lives but those for are, working people. But those are long-term reforms which may or may not improve lives for working people. You hope that they will. But right now, as you sit here as the brand new Labour Chancellor, there is nothing that you are doing that will immediately put money into the pockets of working people. And there is one thing that lots of your colleagues wish you would do which would put money into the pockets of many families who are hard pressed by lifting the bars on benefits being paid to families who have more than two children. And it's not just a few you know, pockets of backbenchers. There are serious Labour figures like Andy Burnham who want you to do this. Gordon Brown wants you to do this. You could lift half a million children out of relative poverty straight away if you made that choice. Laura, it costs more than £3 billion a year. And we were really clear during the election that we were not going to make spending commitments without being able to say where the money was going to come from. And if I said to you now, we're going to make those changes this year or next year or the year after, you would rightly say, where's the money going to come from from that? If we're not able to say where the money is going to come from, we can't promise to do it. And that's true when it comes to the two-child limit and anything else. But if you ask, are we going to lift kids out of poverty? Absolutely we are. And look at the, some of the things that we have committed to do and that we will do. Uh, free breakfast clubs at all primary schools so that all children get a good breakfast in the morning and to help their mums and dads be able to take more hours at work um, or to, to get a job. Uh, the creation of 3,000 additional nurseries with 100,000 places to help, again, working parents uh, be able to work to provide for their families. The New Deal for working people to turn the minimum wage into a real living wage, banning exploitative zero-hour contracts. These are all things that would have a material impact on child poverty. Previous Labour governments have lifted kids out of poverty. It is what is in our DNA. We will do that, but I'm not willing to make unfunded commitments because what happens when you make unfunded commitments, whether they're around tax or spending, is the economy crashes. And that financial market turbulence ends up costing the most vulnerable in society even more through higher mortgages and higher rents. And I am going to run our economy with iron discipline, bringing stability back, because we haven't had stability, families haven't had stability for the last uh, few years, uh, and growing our economy so that we've got more money to spend on the people's priorities. But people are going to have to wait because those are things that will take time, although I know that you say it's urgent and I know that you want to get cracking. Um, do you acknowledge that actually since you've been here, the economy is starting to improve, inflation's back to normal, actually growth has been revised up? Well, we've also seen just this week the government borrowing numbers which is significantly higher than people had anticipated. And that goes to the real true extent of the public finances and the public spending pressures. We also saw labour market data, unemployment up, economic inactivity uh, up. 
So I really don't buy this idea that somehow we've been handed a, a golden inheritance. If the prime, former Prime Minister and Chancellor had have thought things were so good, they would have allowed the election to take place in the autumn. They called an election because they weren't willing to make tough decisions and they just ran away. That is deeply irresponsible. It now falls upon this new Labour government to tackle the challenges that we face as a country, as an economy. And we are going to do that. But we will do it in an open, a responsible and an honest way. And that is very different from what we've seen these last 14 years. I want to ask you about President Biden, obviously this turmoil in your sister party across the Atlantic. I know that every politician in government will want to be diplomatic and not want to stick their oar in. But I just wonder, I know you've paid close attention to what he's done with the American economy. How would you describe President Biden's contribution and do you think he should run in this race? Well, look, those are decisions for the American people. But um, in the uh, first or second day in this job, uh, I had the privilege of speaking to the US Finance Secretary, uh, Janet Yellen, uh, somebody who's been a big inspiration uh, to me. I had a chance to meet her last year in Washington and to speak to her this week. And some of the things that they're doing in the US uh, to reindustrialize the former industrial uh, heartlands, to bring good jobs back to uh, America, uh, I take inspiration from those things because I do want to ensure that Britain gets its fair share of investment, that we bring jobs in industries from life sciences to uh, uh, green industries like carbon capture and, and storage, uh, support our financial services sector that employs more than a million people. Uh, I want good jobs more economic growth, more prosperity here in Britain. The US has uh, outperformed us in terms of uh, growth and prosperity these last few years uh, under the leadership of Biden and Janet Yellen. Uh, and I think there is a lot that we can learn as we try and grow our economy here in Britain. What do you think it's going to be like living above the shop? You're literally moving in this weekend, I think. Uh, yes, so I had my uh, my first uh, night's sleep in the uh, in the flat here in Downing Street um, uh, this weekend, and my family will be moving in uh, with me. It's a big change for our family. I've got uh, two young children, but uh, uh, I'm excited about the opportunity to to do this job. The first two weeks, I sort of moved into the treasury, uh, and this weekend, moving into the flat. Uh, but there's a lot to do, and we've only just begun. And there's a tradition of chancellors having often their predecessors hanging on a portrait looking down on them above the desk. Have you decided who you're going to put on your wall? Uh, well, the, the picture of Nigel Lawson has come down uh, uh, and a new picture will, will go up. And you know that I've been hugely inspired by, by many women in politics and in uh, economics. Uh, women like uh, uh, Ellen Wilkinson, Jenny Lee, Alice Bacon in, in politics and in economics. Women like Joan Robinson or, or Mary Paley Marshall. So I haven't made a decision, but a picture will be going up on that wall. And it will be a, a woman? It will be a woman. Rachel Reeves, Chancellor, thanks very much indeed for speaking to us today. Thank you. And just a reminder, in a couple of minutes, we'll be talking to Jeremy Hunt, who moved out of that office only a couple of weeks ago. But let's see what our panel made of it. I mean, Zara, you want her to lift the bar on families with more than two kids being able to claim some extra benefits. She is not budging. I suppose in a broader sense, how difficult are you on the left prepared to make life for the leadership? Well, if the Labour Party has a moral mission, it has to be to eradicate poverty, especially child poverty. There are families experiencing unnecessary hardship. Rachel mentioned uh, tough decisions. We can fund this if we look at different tax decisions where the wealthiest with the broadest shoulders pay for this. We can. We are the sixth largest economy in the world, yet one of the most unequal in the developed world. We can fund this commitment if we want to, and it's a matter of political will. We can uplift 300,000 kids in instantly from poverty if we do this. But I just wonder, she's really clear that she's not going to do it. She's not prepared to put taxes up for this particular idea. And for you then on the left, how hard are you going to push and are you going to be able to when the government and the leadership has got such a big majority? Well, this policy is the policy of Labour Party's 11 affiliated unions. It's also mm. the policy of the TUC, which speaks up for 6 million workers so this is uh you know not a, a radical demand in fact if rachel decided to put a two percent wealth tax on assets over 10 billion you could raise 24 billion pounds a year if you want to equalize capital gains with income uh, rate thresholds you can raise 16.7 billion so when we say that there isn't any money to fund this we're not looking in the right places okay so you're obviously not going to give up on this particular part of campaigning but um, stephanie when you heard her there clearly hint that she is going to give public sector pay workers some form of pay 
pay rise above inflation. I mean, she's not committing to the mm. full boon of the 5.5% mm. that's been uh, suggested. But where is she going to be able to get money from? I mean, this demands on child. Yeah, you know. I mean, I would say just to just to mm. not that I, I don't want to correct you, Laura, but I don't think You're she said she, to. she didn't say here? she wasn't going to do it. She said she wasn't going to do it without saying where the money was exactly. going to come from. So I think that left plenty of room for finding that money if she decides to do that. I think there's a sort of symbolic question of whether that's the big that's the thing she wants to find the money for. Because yes, you can find you know there's a few billion to be found at least, but you can't spend that five times. And there's you know there's many things that she's being asked to spend on including the public sector pay so you know I think there will be a few things mm -hmm. where they find the money there is some leeway in both you know, the, some of the debt targets and the the borrowing target but it, it was just really interesting to hear her you could see there's still you hear this from all the um, new ministers the and secretaries of state that you've got the thrill of actually being able to take decisions every day I can do this and then the sort of mystification of well why didn't they do this and of course that's nice to play for the political theatre as well but whether it comes to public sector pay or I think these crucial things of what she talked about the house building mm -hmm. the um, you know planning all of that stuff is going to require a continued sort of devotion to detail and sort of micro action there'll be legal challenges against some of the solar farms all of those things and I think it's that question of whether they will continue to have the energy to fight this on the ground mm. because if they don't achieve those micro things actually the macro picture is going to stay very I just difficult. I want to bring John in a sec but I'm interested though you said that there is money to be found from where is money to be found well so there are there are certainly small sort of tax rises you can do I think you could you can also make small changes to the some of the debt targets I personally also think that you know we will see growth revised up a bit over Again. the next year or two because there is it looks like it will be um, higher forecasts for investment I mean you know we'll see because I think the office of budget responsibility is going to make this decision but I suspect there will there will be a few billion but there won't be money for all of the things that she's gone pressure to, Who'd to spend imagine on. the chancellors might end up moving their numbers around a little bit to, <laughs> when, to, to make life a bit easier for them in terms of the politics but John listening to that as a voter and you said to before you feel that sense and sensibility has has returned what did you what stood out to you well, it's so fascinating seeing these first interviews mm. the early ones mm -hmm. in the heart of the honeymoon period mm -hmm. where there is a great focus on what we inherited, what we've been given to work with. Do we realise how bad this is? Mm. It's a few short weeks before relying on that evaporates and then it's about what are you going to do. The details in that sense at the moment seem a little broad but let us see how they fine tune. But in know. terms of then as a, as a member of the public yeah. That tactic we've seen from Labour ministers almost across the board saying, guys, it's worse than we knew, it's even worse. Do you see that as them trying to spin you or do you take that as a genuine discovery that's now being communicated to oh, the they voters? must know. They, they, they must surely know. But the question is, in the early stages, it's how do we um, explain this? How do we manage this? Little information is given away. In the, when, when, when you hear, right, we will set this out, we're going to set this out, I think the translation of that is we don't know yet. Hang on, give us a few weeks. OK, well, yeah, by the end of this month, we expect her to come back to yeah. Parliament with a, a big sort of warts and all assessment of the public finances. But, Zara, I just want to come back to you on the sort of the politics of how this might all work. You're clearly, along with your colleagues, very determined to campaign on the issues that are close to your heart. But do you think that the leadership with such a big majority is actually going to have to listen to you? Well, we are all MPs with constituencies. We've been knocking on doors for six weeks before the general election. This is an issue that comes up time and time. The cost of living, how people are really struggling. We've seen wages flatline, yet the wealth of the very richest in this country has skyrocketed. Billionaires in the UK have seen their wealth go up threefold under the Tories. That is just shy of 700 billion in total. So there is money in the economy. Some people have done really well under the Tories austerity programme and it's not ordinary working people. Stephanie, just briefly, if you can, can you explain what the government's trying to do on pensions? And actually, if you're watching at home and you hear, all oh, pensions reform, is that a good or a bad thing if you're an ordinary saver? I think, I mean, obviously, they're tr they're tr they've talked a lot about trying to get the pool of, of savings that people make um, more available for these big infrastructure projects and other things. I think, you know, at the, her predecessor also tri mm. tried that. I think she'll be continuing some of the reforms that, that Jeremy Hunt did. Um, but it is a continuing challenge. You know, if you've been invested in the UK recently, you haven't done very well relative to investing in the US so telling pensioners oh actually or telling big 
pension funds, you can't invest pensioners' money in, the con in countries that are going doing best. You have to invest in the UK. I think that is a challenging ask. Okay, interesting. Thank you, all three of you. Well, with Labour, Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer moving in, of course, the Tories had to pack their bags. The whole Hunt family with the very well-behaved Poppy the dog, who, oh, sadly, you can't quite see in the shot. Maybe you'll see her in a second. Walked out of number 11 for the final time. But Jeremy Hunt has returned to the studio, even though he's no longer in office. And it's great to have you here for your first interview since the general election. Good morning. Um, good morning. Now, Rachel Reeves told us she's angry at what you left behind. She said the public finances are dire and that you fudged tough decisions and ran away. She has a point, doesn't she? Well, first of all, I wish Rachel Reeves well. Um, on a personal level, I think she has qualities that could make her a good chancellor. And um, there are things that she said that I welcome. I welcome what she wants to do on pensions, which you were just talking about with Stephanie. Uh, I welcome what she wants to do on planning reform. Um, but what is absolute nonsense is this business of the worst economic inheritance since the Second World War. I mean, you only need to look at the last time a government changed hands between parties in 2010. Compared to then, inflation is nearly half what it was. Uh, we have, then we had markets collapsing. Now we have the fastest growth in the G7. Uh, we have unemployment nearly half what it was then. It's a very transformed picture. And I think the reason that she's doing this is that she wants to lay the ground for tax rises. Now, perfectly legitimate for a new government to come in and say they want to spend more and tax more. Every Labour government in history has done that, but she should have been honest about that before the election uh, rather than trying to yeah, spring it well, on us on, after the election. Well, hang on, but you're trying to suggest what she might do, and we don't have a crystal ball, but just to pick you up on that, you know, government debt is the highest it has been since 1962. Government debt is nearly at the same size of the whole of the economy. The unemployment rate actually recently has started ticking up again. Economic inactivity has started ticking up again, so people not in work who could be... And all of our viewers this morning, Jeremy Hunt, know that in the last few years, under successive Conservative governments, the economy has been bumping along the bottom and people have felt terribly hard up. So you're not going to sit here this morning, surely, and say, actually, what you left behind was old peaches and cream. Not at all. Um, we faced in the last 14 years three massive global shocks. Uh, the pandemic, the energy shock, clearing up after the financial crisis. And despite those pressures, uh, we grew faster than France, Germany, Italy, Japan, many other similar Only countries. Only in some of the very recent but figures. I mean, everybody watching this morning, I just want to make this clear, everybody knows, and Stephanie was telling us at the beginning, that under Conservatives for 14 years, the economy has had some very fundamental problems and bumped along the bottom, and there are lots of problems that you didn't Fix. I'm sorry, Laura, but I just do need to correct you there um, without wanting to relitigate all the debates we had in the election. But since 2014, so, sorry, since 2010, when we had all those shocks, uh, all those things we had to cope with, we have grown faster than France or Germany or Italy or Japan, many other similar countries. And when you talk about public finances, which you spend a lot of time talking to Rachel mm -hmm. Rees about, all chancellors have to manage pressures in public finances. That is part of the job. But when Conservatives came to office in 2010, we had a deficit of nearly 12% of GDP. It is now just over 4%. And indeed, it's predicted to turn into a surplus in just four years. So I don't pretend it's easy. It's never easy being Chancellor, particularly not after a pandemic and an energy shock. But the reason that we're getting all this spin about this terrible economic inheritance is because Labour wants to raise so taxes. So you think it's you think it's a spin? And yes, it is. And if they wanted to raise taxes, all the numbers were crystal clear before the election. They had the Office for Budget Responsibility telling them those numbers. They should have levelled with the British public and said that, like every other Labour government, we want to increase spending and increase tax well, to you pay are, for it. You are criticising them for guessing something that they would do. But Rachel Reeves' claims is that you went to the country early it was because you knew the problems were coming down the track and you didn't want to deal with them. The teacher's pay review, for example, was sitting on the education secretary's desk for a few months. We know that. What was going on in prisons, we know the former justice secretary, your old colleague Alex Chalk, was begging the prime minister to do something more radical about it. And he didn't do it. He refused. You hadn't paid out for the infected blood scandal, which is going to be a huge bill. Isn't there a case that you were actually quite happy to let things sit and rot because you knew that you would leave it for somebody else to clean up? 
Laura, you have interviewed me on many occasions over the years, and you can criticise me for many things, but not taking tough and difficult decisions is one thing I don't think people would level at me. When but I this became is about leaving yes, things behind. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to tell you what we inherited and what we left behind. And I've just said that compared to the inheritance that we had in 2010, this is a transformed picture, albeit with many challenges. But when I became Chancellor, I had to put up taxes by £20 billion. I had to cut spending plans by £30 billion. The story, I think, of the last mm -hmm. 18 months is of a government that has taken very but you had to do decisions. that because of the misadventures of a Conservative Prime Minister who was only in charge for just over 40 days and created absolute mayhem. Were you well, ever... Well, hang on, we, we can go back to the discussions about the mini-budget, but the, the main... Re we reversed those uh, mistakes, and they were mistakes, very quickly. But the reason we had to make those difficult decisions on tax and spending was because we spent £400 billion supporting families and businesses in the pandemic. But and where... we were right to do that. And Labour and everyone supported us when we did that. But, of course, you have to pay for that. Were you ever going to be able to cut taxes in the autumn? Well, I believe... I'm look, look, I was looking until a couple of weeks ago at the same numbers that Rachel Reeves is now looking at. And it's very clear that if you are prepared to show restraint on public sector pay, as we did last year, if you're prepared to be ambitious on public sector productivity, as I was in the budget, and you're prepared to do welfare reform, which was glaringly absent from the King's speech, if you do those three things, it's perfectly possible to balance the books in a way that means that taxes don't have to rise. Now, I think it's very clear from what we've seen in the first two weeks of this Labour government that they're not prepared to take those difficult decisions. Well, hang on, decisions. I'm asking you a question about what you were planning to do, because during the election campaign, our viewers heard you and your colleagues sitting in that chair every week saying that you would cut taxes. And there have been reports this week that now in the shadow cabinet, you told colleagues that actually the Treasury had said you wouldn't be able to do tax cuts in the autumn. Is that true, or do you deny that you said that? Well, we said, and I still believe very strongly, that if we're going to grow as an economy, uh, we can't do what Labour is now doing, which is ignore the evidence from around the world that countries with lower taxes have I'm higher growth. I want to ask you. I want to answer your question. I want you to directly yeah, answer this question. I will answer your question. I will answer. But we would. We always said we would cut taxes in a responsible way. We never said that we would cut them as soon as this autumn, and that would depend on the public finances. And so we were very clear. But yes, we did have plans in place that would have allowed us to reduce the tax burden but your campaign was on a promise of cutting taxes. Do you deny telling the Shadow Cabinet in the last week that the Treasury said you wouldn't have been able to do it this autumn? I don't think we would have been able to do it immediately, no. But okay. I think we would have been able to do it in time and we had plans in place to do that. Why do you think you got hammered in the election, even though you kept your seat? Well, um, I think we have to be honest, humble and reflective that after 14 years of massive economic challenges, uh, we got some things right, uh, particularly putting the economy back on its feet in areas like standards in schools. But at the end of that period, uh, we decisively lost the trust of the British people. Um, and I think there were three main reasons why uh, we did that. I think the first is that uh, the upheavals of 2022, which you talked about, um, not just the mini-budget, but Partygate and other things, meant we lost our reputation for calm competence, which is one of the main reasons people vote for Conservatives. We also didn't bring immigration down by anything like as much as we wanted to. Um, and also, I had to put taxes up to pay for the pandemic, and I don't think we succeeded in convincing people that we had a plan to bring them back down again. And we now need to be very honest about those failures, uh, because this country needs a strong opposition. And I think you can see already from Labour's first two weeks, if I just give you one example, um, they scrapped the Rwanda plan, and we've already had more than 1,500 people arriving on small boats. As, as they also were when the Rwanda plan was existing. But we had, but no, but I think the point is... There, well, but, 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 yeah. I, but I want to talk, talk about what happened in the party, because you've given three very clear reasons. The, the chaos under Johnson and Trust and party gates a failure to tackle immigration and a failure also to, to, to acknowledge why you had to put taxes up so much and to persuade people that you were going to bring them down. Isn't there also the way in which the party handled all of this? 
because I think for many of our viewers, and we see this from our inbox every week, just became fed up by you squabbling in public, concentrating on yourselves rather than the country. And I know you're trying to calmly to explain it this morning, but the recent history of the Tory party is sort of a litany of disaster. It's not that you just had three things that went wrong. Well, I think there were lots of things you could point to. I think those are the three substantive things uh, which we got wrong. But yes, um, the British people want to elect united parties and we didn't show uh, that united front that people want to see. I, I fully accept that. But I think it's also important to say when you look back at the last 14 years, over 4 million jobs were created. That is 800 jobs for every single day that we were in office. You were talking to Rachel Reeves about investment. We got more foreign greenfield investment than anywhere in the world, apart from the United States and China, over those 14 years. Um, and we had an economy that grew faster than many of our peers. But in terms of what happens next then for your party, how do you fix it and who should fix it? I mean, the field of potential runners is sort of as big as the Grand National, but who do you think has the answers and why? Well, it won't be me. I'm not going to put my hat into the ring uh, for the leadership election. Um, and I don't know who is, so I don't want to make a comment on who that might be. But what I would say is that the first thing is we have to be honest about why we lost the trust of the, election, the electorate. We, we can't duck that difficult conversation. And we need to earn it back uh, by being uh, absolutely clear that we do have solutions and we're going to hold the government to account, it's, taking account of the things that we got wrong it's before. It's interesting you mentioned immigration, though, is one of the problems. And Robert Jenrick, who's very likely to run, has said that that was a key failure of the party. He thinks there should be a legal cap on immigration at 100,000. But then you have other people in the party saying that moving overtly to the right would be the wrong tack to take. So in terms of direction, even if you don't want to give us a name, where do you think the party is more likely to win the country back by trying to appeal to maybe reform voters who were tempted by Nigel Farage or by cleaving to the centre, which others of your colleagues think was the mistake here? Well, in a two-party system in the UK, as we have, elections are always run from the centre ground. But I think the really interesting question is, what is the centre ground in British politics. And I think ordinary, decent British families want controls on migration. They want the government to show restraint on spending and keep taxes down. They want welfare to be reformed so it's fair to people who get up early in the morning and work hard. I think that is the centre ground. That is where the Conservatives uh, should be. And we need to carve out a position that does that, but reflects honestly on the fact that we didn't get everything right and we need to uh, be open about why we didn't get everything right. And that is the way we'll give people confidence that we'll be able to do things differently and at going the moment, forward. At the moment, the party can't even agree how the leadership race is to be run. But do you think there needs to be a new leader in place by the party conference in October? What I would say is I understand the arguments uh, in both directions on that. But this time next year, the only thing that will matter is not whether we had a new leader in place by October or December but whether we have the right leader in place, someone who can earn back that trust that we lost. And so I think if we need to, we absolutely should take our time. And you did many big jobs in government, not just as the Chancellor. Health Secretary was one of them. And during that time, you were responsible for preparing for the pandemics. Um, the COVID inquiry report this week says the preparation and then some of the delivery of government at the beginning of the pandemic failed citizens and that lives were lost unnecessarily is the very clear implication of the report. Would you this morning like to apologise for what went wrong? Absolutely. I was one of uh, the many ministers, many officials, many scientists who were part of a group think where we over-prepared for pandemic flu. We didn't think about other types of pandemic. Um, and we should have challenged that group think. Uh, and, you know, I apologise unreservedly to the families. That was the most terrible tragedy, what happened to this country during COVID. And, it, and I think, by the way, the report has some very sensible recommendations, uh, including simplifying the structures for preparing for these kinds of emergencies. And I very much hope the government adopts them. OK, Jeremy, thank you very much indeed for coming in thank and you. being with us this morning for your first interview after the general election. Thank you. Now then, as you know, every now and then we like to bring you something that is just unashamedly beautiful. And today it's the music of the superstar violinist Nicola Benedetti. She also happens to be the boss of the Edinburgh Festival and she stopped by last week. 
So it's a festival of long tradition, uh, started in 1947. It was actually the original festival in Edinburgh, the one that started it all, and uh, hosts all sorts of different arts. So it's very diverse and eclectic with music, dance, drama, um, theatre and all styles of music as well. So for me, uh, obviously the job is um, a, a huge honour, but a massive responsibility for the cultural landscape of Scotland. Um, but that is so tied to the nature of education in the country. Um, so that advocacy really does broaden. Because for some people, classical music can be a bit intimidating, or even if you think of the sort of prices of going to a big concert or even going to the opera or something. So it is part of what you're trying to do just make it easier and more welcoming for everybody? Well, we're looking at very practical obstacles like ticket prices. So 50% of our tickets are £30 and under. Uh, and for every single performance, you can get a ticket for £10. Um, but at the same time, uh, there is a wider question there around what would stop people coming to a certain type of performance. Um, and I, again, think that that is, you know, young introduction to being exposed to all sorts of styles of art. Uh, and something that is, um, is, is open to you, doesn't feel like a foreign land. And you were a, you know, a superstar as a teenager, but how do you think in the 2020s, you know, when public money is very tight, mm. we know that fewer kids are learning to play classical music. Do you think that government and even you know, taxpayers have a role in trying to make this something that's available for anyone who's interested? I uh, have always advocated that music and the expressive arts and creativity are part of a first-class education for everyone, should be. Um, I think the question we have to ask is, do we value that as a civic pillar? Do we value that as a part of a civilization that we want to see not just be maintained and sustained, but really prosper and grow? And obviously with the political landscape at the moment, a moment of real change and um, so many new characters that we as artists and cultural advocates can communicate with and speak to directly. Um, I'm excited to see that be more sort of um, included in the fold of what is vital for, for education. Have you got then a message to this new government? I always do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are at a time where problems need to be solved and they can't be solved through uh, just um, protecting what's there because that just results in stagnation. We need the ultimate creativity in our young people to, to imagine their way out of where we are and into something new. And in order to do that, you have to speak to the invisible parts of who we are. So our thoughts and our feelings and our um, style of communication and creativity. Does that mean in brass tacks, more money for kids' education in Abs schools? Absolutely. Sorry, I couldn't even <laughs> let you finish your sentence. Um, absolutely. For music education, for that wider creative education, um, but also how that falls into the arts organisations that are putting on the performances, that are keeping the concert halls open, um, that are making tickets affordable for anyone and everyone to be able to attend. So you've got a huge job at the festival, a huge job with your incredible career as a musician but you've got something else on your plate now. It's the first time that you've come out to do an interview and perform since you've had your baby. So congratulations Thank from you everybody watching. Much. You know, how's, how's it been? Are you going to go on the road with a little one? Oh, I definitely will be, yes. I mean, it's, um, it's quite nice to be out in the real world <laughs> um, at the moment, but no, it's been a wonderful experience so far and an adjustment to life, of course, but um, a very blessed and happy one. What are you going to play for us and what does it mean to use a piece of music? So the first outing of my, my playing, <laughs> since, since the birth. Um, I'll play A Shock and Farewell um, by uh, Jay Unger, um, which uh, is an American tune, actually, but really pays homage to the, the Scottish mythology and the Scottish sound. Um, so it's a, it's a personalised arrangement of that tune. Okay, well, we look forward to hearing it. And it's been a real privilege to have you here with us on a Sunday morning. Thank you Thank so you much Nicola. for having me. And we'll hear from Nicola in just a couple of minutes. Now, John. We all know that there's such a treat hearing your special interpretations of our politicians and our high profile people. And I must ask what you have been working on as we've seen the political landscape change in the country. Does that mean a new turn? Yes, exactly. It, it just changes over, regenerates. It's been quite interesting seeing the difference in Keir Starmer now okay. that he's prime minister. Yeah, as leader of the opposition, though, he was very overcautious.
<laughs> it, that's what, now that's translated into steadiness. I'm, OK, I'm going to go and stand by some world leaders and look <laughs> credible, because that's what I do. So, yeah, there's that sort of sensibility. <laughs> Interesting seeing the changes after the John Major years. You know, Tony Blair was, you know, let's liven things up. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, and now it's, it's as if Keir Starmer's coming in and so, saying, right, settle down, class, settle down, let's be sensible now. Well, that's funny, because somebody in the Cabinet was saying that actually sometimes it's a bit like he's a, a headmaster and they sort of seem like the school prefects and they're he's checking they've all done their homework but how do you do your Keir Starmer impression have you had to think about changing it or maybe there's a bit more demand for it these days well yes uh, instantly anytime somebody becomes the prime minister they move up the charts of the act <laughs> and anytime you perform you know they've got to be there and it's how they interact with the others you know Angela Rayner bringing this sort of uh, sort of John Prescott-esque energy to counter that is another interesting thing and just seeing how the family settles down the pieces of the snowstorm ornament are all around like that but they do settle and it's interesting to observe where uh, they land and who's your favorite character to do out with the new regime well I, I love I love listening to uh, Jess Robinson on Dead Ringers who does Rachel Reeves and uh, the first uh, Rachel Reeves sketch there was instant recognizability from the audience mm -hmm. uh, to how Jess was doing it I think the the technique for Rachel Reeves with Jess was start at um, Stacey Solomon oddly enough <laughs> Why up there? Who oh, hears? And then sort of bring it down to this kind of place here, you know, smile in the voice. So I think that's how she decoded it. OK, John, thank you very much indeed for giving us a taste of that. Um, Zara, who, I suppose, when you look at the Cabinet, who do you look at and think they're most in tune with your values from the left of the Labour Party? When I look at the Cabinet, I find um, Angela Rayner's work on the New Deal for Working People really important. I think that will make a huge difference to people's lives and actually rebalance power and wealth. And when we look at the attacks on trade union movements uh, since the 80s, this is how we can address that fundamental She's issue. A very interesting voice in the next few years. Absolutely. Stephanie, a closing thought from you on the new landscape that we all survey. Well, I'm struck when you're talking to Jeremy Hunt that we actually don't have to worry. Most normal people don't have to worry what happens to the Conservative Party and what the difference is between them over the next few years. They're not going to have much impact on policy or what happens in the UK, but they do have to decide what kind of party they're going to be, whether it's a kind of double-down Trumpian populist ask or the kind of quiet competence rebuilding of people's trust that Jeremy Hunt talked about. Well, we will see. It was interesting to hear that he would be willing for the leadership race to go long, but we have gone on long enough this morning. It's great to have all three of you with us. A big thank you to all my guests today and, of course, to you for your company. Victoria will be here next week, so that is nearly it from me for the summer. As ever, though, I'll be with Paddy O'Connell on Weekend Newscast there he is on BBC Sounds later and tomorrow night on BBC One at 8 do watch Panorama we've been behind closed doors with the new government in its first two weeks and then I will see you again here on September the 8th same time same place but as promised here is Nicola to say goodbye <laughs>